may all living beings be happy. It sounds impossible. And in some ways it is. As the Buddha said, all beings subsist on food. And the problem is some beings are food for other beings. And if we think of happiness in terms of pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, there's never enough. As the Buddha said, even if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't get enough happiness of that kind. So it's important to think about why we repeat that phrase. And the first thing to remember is that we're trying to get our own intentions in line with the Dharma, in line with the practice. Part of right resolve is getting rid of ill will, developing goodwill. We keep repeating the phrase because it's part of our motivation. It's part that we want to train into our motivation when you act and when you speak and when you think. When you make choices, you want to make sure that the choices are harmless. As the Buddha said, this is part of being a person of integrity. That's one of the first steps in the practice, to anticipate what the results of your actions are going to be and resolve that you're not going to act on any intentions that are harmful. If you don't foresee any harm or you're not sure, well, you can try it out, and then you check to see what the results are. If you see that you're causing harm or that you have caused harm, then you, then you stop and resolve never to repeat that mistake again. And of course what happens as you undertake this exercise and bring it into the meditation, you begin to realize that Things that originally seemed harmless actually do, on a more subtle or more sensitive level, do cause harm. But this is how we grow in the practice. There's no other way to learn. Don't how many people come and say, how can I live a life without making mistakes? How do you know what the right thing to do is? Then the only way to find out the right thing is to experiment. Simply that some things are clearly unskillful, and yet we still go ahead and do them. That's what you've got to watch out for from the very beginning. The Buddha gives you some guidelines. We're not reinventing the Dharma wheel all the time. Killing, stealing, illicit sex, lying, taking intoxicants, and other forms of wrong speech in addition to lying. There's divisive tail-bearing, where you're trying to break people up, break up a friendship because you feel threatened by the friendship, hurtful speech, idle chatter, the kind of talk that accomplishes nothing. It's a lot of froth. You want to learn how to avoid that. You engage in conversation to the point where, as in a social gathering, you need a little social grease to keep things going, but you have to remember that too much grease gums up the works. So the Buddha does give you some basic guidelines, and it's learning how to refine your sensitivity to what's harmful. That's where we develop more mindfulness, more alertness, try to be more concentrated, so we can develop the discernment that catches harmful actions on more and more subtle levels. So when we wish that all beings be happy. Part of it is that we're trying to develop this motivation that we don't want to harm anybody in our actions, because that's all we're responsible for is our own actions. And then you also think about the fact that the happiness there, may all beings be happy, it has to come from causes. It's not simply we go around with a magic wand and touch beings on the heads and say, okay, whatever you're doing right now, be happy. 
because a lot of activities that people do are harmful to themselves, to other people. It's a part of being truly happy, and that's the important part, the true happiness. Part of being truly happy is to learn how to stop doing unskillful actions. This is why part of the Karaniya Metta Sutta is that may no being despise any other being anywhere. Not simply may beings be happy, but may they not act on the causes that would create unhappiness. Then the question is, to what extent can you influence that? And you find there are some people you can influence. As the Buddha said, when you become generous, it's also good to encourage other people to be generous as well. When you're virtuous and you see the rewards of virtue, you try to encourage others to be virtuous too. You should gain more conviction in the Buddha's awakening and see, in particular, the results of the principle of action, the principle of karma. You do what you can to encourage others. Now, you don't want to become an unpleasant proselytizer. You're not an evangelist here. But in cases where you see that people are open and are receptive, you want to sh share with them the benefits of your practice. Say, this works for me, it might work for you. The same with wisdom and discernment. It's good to be able to share what you've got to encourage other people to develop their wisdom and their discernment. But, and this is where it gets difficult, there are limits to how much you can influence the behavior of other people. That's where equanimity comes in. Remember, goodwill and compassion are not just there on their own. They have to be coupled with empathetic joy and equanimity. Actually, the goodwill, the compassion, the empathetic joy all go together. Goodwill is the wish for true happiness when you see beings are suffering. You want them to be released from their suffering. That's basically applying goodwill in that case, and that, that's what compassion is. And empathetic joy is goodwill applied to cases where you see that people are already happy. May they continue to be happy. May they continue to develop the causes for happiness. You're not resentful of their happiness. You're not resentful of their good fortune. So again, it all comes back to your motivation. You keep reminding yourself again and again, may all beings be happy. And then you ask yourself, are my actions in line with that wish? So it becomes a test, a standard for you to look at as you, as you go through the day. That even though, it, given the way the world is with beings feeding on other beings, and given their limited resources, and the kind of happiness that comes from wealth, status, praise, physical pleasures, has a limited, limited range. In other words, the more some people get, the less other people are going to get. So given those limitations, you realize that it's not likely that the world is going to find true happiness. But you want to make sure that your motivation is right, because that's what you're responsible for. And in doing this, you're giving a gift to others. As the Buddha said, if your determination not to kill, not to steal, not to break any other precepts is without exception. In other words, you don't make exception for ants or termites or white lies or anything, you say, no, I'm not going to do any of these things that are unskillful. Okay, you're giving unlimited safety to others. I mean, at least they're safe from you and the harm that you could cause them. And then you have a share in that unlimited safety yourself. Other beings not being harmed by you are not going to come back and harm you. Of course, we all have our mixed past karma. But still, given the fact that right now, from now on, and in the future, you want to make sure your motivation is right. That's all you can really be asked to do. And as the Buddha said, given the fact that we have past karma, doesn't mean that it's determined that we're going to have to suffer. The state of mind that we develop in the present moment is going to play a huge role in how we 
experience the results of past bad karma. You develop an unlimited mind state, unlimited goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. That helps to lessen the amount of suffering you're going to have. In some cases, the Buddha said, you hardly even notice it. It's like a person who suddenly incurs a debt or has, has to pay a fine. If you're wealthy, the fine is hardly going to make a dent. You hardly notice it at all. If you're poor, they might have to throw you in prison because you don't have enough money to pay, to pay the fine. So you're developing this wealth of the mind. And even further, when you train the mind so it's not overcome by pleasure and not overcome by pain. Unless you're able to maintain your mindfulness, alertness, maintain your steadiness even when there's pain in the body and when, even when there's pleasure in the body. Pain in the mind, pleasure in the mind. You have a solid place, which is your spot, your safe spot, your source of strength inside. And when you develop this limitless mind, And you've given yourself from protection from your past bad karma. So these are the reasons why we develop that thought, may all beings be happy. Because we want to make sure that we don't harm beings. And by creating our own more limitless state of mind, we develop the ability to deal with whatever negative things happen. In other words, we learn how to take responsibility for ourselves. We take responsibility for our, the current decisions we're making now about what we want to do and say and think, and we're also taking responsibility for how we respond to what comes up as a result of our past karma. So in this phrase, may all beings be happy, it's this phrase of taking full responsibility. So once we make that intention, you try to act in line with it. This is one of the reasons we're meditating right here, right now, is to develop that ability not to be overcome by pain, not to be overcome by pleasure. So the mind can continue being responsible even in the face of great pain or great pleasure. You hear of some people who develop an extreme sense of pleasure in the meditation, and they get carried away. They get irresponsible. Sometimes they get depressed. It's, the meditation is so good, and when they leave it, they feel disappointed that that great pleasure has to end. And you have to realize we're not here just for the pleasure. We're here to use the pleasure for a higher end, to train the mind, to develop more discernment, to develop more intelligent ways of dealing with pleasure and pain. And the same with pain. A lot of people will excuse harmful behavior because they were under great psychological stress or great physical pain. And there are cases when the pain really is debilitating, you can't do much. But there are other times when you, if you develop the mindfulness and alertness and the discernment, You're still capable of more than you might have been otherwise, even in the face of pain. So we have to be very clear about our motivation. And again, our motivation is what we can be responsible for. We can't be responsible for the whole world. Because the way the world is designed, it's all eating and eating and eating. And even if you help poor people to get a better break in life, well, they, they continue eating. And it would be nice if the world were like, was it Kurt Vonnegut's vision of Mercury with all these beings that feed off the, the vibrations of the crystal. He saw Mercury as this big honeycomb crystal that was set into vibration because one side was hot and the other side was cold. And the beings simply had to 
latch on to some part of that honeycomb crystal and just feed off the vibrations. They didn't have to feed off each other. And for them it was a lot easier to be, be happy as they were and to be happy for everybody else, simply as they were. Here I am, here I am, so glad you are, so glad you are. Those are the messages they were sending to, each, to one another. But here we live in a world where beings have to feed, and they feed on one another. So the wish for happiness has to take a different form. May all beings eventually find true happiness. That means I don't want to do anything that's going to harm them now, and I don't want to do anything that's going to get in the way of their ultimately finding true happiness. And if I can help them, I'm happy to. If I can't, then you have to accept the fact that that's the way karma goes. Those are some of the implications of it when we repeat again and again, may all living beings be happy. We're trying to keep our motivation straight and in line with the path. <laughs>